so this session is actually being recorded and um, and basically um, if there's anything that you do miss uh, we will actually upload it to our YouTube site at some stage it does take a, a day or two we'll get it up there and, and you guys can actually um, anybody can listen to the session if they if they missed anything so before we even get started I just want to um, I just want to actually launch a poll um, and it's a very quick one uh, just want to see who are first-time comrades, marathon runners, who's done one, who's doing the second, who's done five, who's done 20. Um, if you guys can actually respond to that, that would be great. It would be just very interesting to see. I'll give you a few seconds to, to respond. Okay, that's great. I'm going to close that poll. Um, I'd just like to say that um, about 25% of the respondees actually, this is their first Comrades Marathon. So, so that's quite a high percentage, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which is quite amazing. And I think actually, I mean, if, if, if information comes along like this freely, then I think it's great to attend the webinar and actually get as much information as possible. So I'm going to move on um, uh, just with the agenda for for what we're going to discuss this evening and basically we're going to talk about taper weeks um, and I think it's a very very critical period in terms of nutrition and training um, and we'll discuss that in quite a bit of detail uh, we'll talk about the days prior to the race and that could be a couple of days leading up to the race or that week leading up to the race again nutrition and training require some very specific focus the day before, um, that will include obviously the night before and then on race day, what you should be uh, trying to do on race day itself. So we're going to cover all those particular areas. And um, I think uh, when it comes to race week nutrition, uh, it's, it's very, very important to understand that um, nutrition plays a very, very critical role. Um, training time is reduced and you are on a complete taper. And from a nutrition point of view, I think that um, from a nutrition point of view, um, you've got to be even more focused because what actually happens when uh, you're in a type of period and you reduce your volume of training, you tend to carry on eating the same. And the last thing that you want to do is arrive at a race day and uh, be even a kilogram or even half a kilogram heavy in weight. If you haven't trained at that weight and you land up on race day racing or running at a much heavier heavier weight and 500 grams believe me is, is weight um, you are going to suffer on race day and that's the last thing you want to do so there's two very important things that you need to focus on obviously there's a sharpening and um, but but nutrition is is actually very very critical when it comes to nutrition program for any endurance event it should be very well thought out and tested and then documented for the big day and the reason we held the webinar at this stage is that you still have time to at least still make sure that you've got your nutrition down pat. So there's still a little bit of testing time available to you and um, and you will have the ability to to play with that. Um, you obviously won't be putting in long, long runs where you're able to test it, but you've got the ability to still test taste, digestive comfort, etc., even in short, hard sessions and, and make sure that you are comfortable and at least start to plan what you're going to do on race day, whether you've got seconds on route, um, how often you're going to consume, um, and 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 obviously that will change uh, through the day, uh, because the temperatures obviously start off a lot cooler and they start to heat up. But we'll discuss that again a little bit later. Um, but the last thing you want to do is arrive there unprepared, because I mean I've I've actually stood at comrades many many times, and I've actually seen a lot of people getting nauseous, getting sick, and the truth of the matter is that they make very very common mistakes, which I think can be very very easily avoided on on the day so just to quickly just chat about a few do's and don'ts before we actually start to talk about the the actual training um, aspect of it and I'll bring Sean and Raymond into that and I'll get them to ch chat about nutrition as well is um, certain things that you should be avoiding leading up to to the big C and I think one of the things is um, is refined carbohydrates I'm talking like all your sugar foods etc um, processed foods such as instant microwave or quick meals uh, and even takeouts, um, deep untrusted fried foods. There's no, there's no point in going to eat deep fried chips and things like that and sugar and sugar laden foods, sweets, chocolates. These are the kind of things that you should be cutting down uh, completely. 
Uh, margarines, not a good idea. Cut it out. Rather have uh, regular butter. Um, and excessive high fiber foods, which can cause bowel discomfort, and also excessive stimulants like numerous cups of coffee and tea. Try and limit that intake as well. Try and get yourself into a healthy habit of eating, especially uh, around three weeks out from, from a big event. What you should be focusing on eating, and I think this is quite key, is uh, if you do eat uh, you know, more of a higher, slightly carbohydrate diet, then I think you look at things such as quinoa, amaranth, oats, sweet potatoes, easily digestible and lighter proteins such as soya, fish, chicken, eggs. Um, if, you, if, you, if you're not a big red meat eater, then don't actually start to try and eat a lot of red meat. If you are used to eating red meat, well, that's fine. Your digestive system is quite used to it and there's no issues with that. Um, try and stick to the healthier fats such as flax seeds, coconut oil, avocado, salmon, etc. Um, and things like nuts and seeds, almonds, cashew, walnuts, chia seeds, sunflower, sesame are all very, very good and very high in, in excellent, uh, excellent uh, fats. Uh, fruit and vegetables on the high percentage should be on the vegetable side. Try and limit your fruit intake because obviously fruit equates to sugar intake and you want to try and keep that as low as possible. And when you do eat fruits, try and rather stick to the berries or the high antioxidant fruits um, and try and try and limit that uh, that fruit intake as much as possible. When it, sticks, when it comes to eating uh, vegetables in the form of uh, uh, spinach, broccoli and rocket are, are probably excellent. Or the greens are very good. Things like cauliflower, chives, uh, uh, Brussels sprouts, uh, those are actually all phenomenal types of vegetables to try and eat. That's if you do eat vegetables. Um, I put a question mark next to dairy because many people actually are uh, lactose intolerant or even slightly dairy intolerant. And by that I mean not just affecting the stomach, but sometimes people get a bit of congestion or nasal congestion and post-nasal issues just because of dairy consumption, even though it doesn't affect the digestive tracts. And I think that is something that you should take note of because if you get a post-nasal drip and it is because of dairy consumption, you put yourself at a high risk of contracting probably a, a, a virus or an illness as you get closer to comrades. I cut dairy completely from my diet, especially um, in the weeks leading up to an event. Um, I want myself to not have any risk of uh, congestion, a post-nasal drip, or anything that would possibly affect me on race day. So just something to keep in mind. If you're 100% sure that uh, you aren't affected by dairy, well, then that's great. Then carry on. Um, when it comes to hydration, I think one of the biggest factors is that uh, you should ensure that you're hydrating constantly and every single day. Uh, I try and recommend that people should take 40 milliliters per kilogram of body weight in fluid, um, at least 30, but try and aim for 40. So that means if you're a 60 kilogram person, you're aiming between 1.8 to 2.4 liters of water a day. And that doesn't say, uh, I'm not saying that comes in the form of coffee. If you have a cup of coffee, add another two cups to, of water to that. I'm talking about really water in its natural form or you can add a bit of, if you want to flavor it and you don't like water, I, was, I recommend sometimes to clients take a bit of grapefruit and squeeze a little bit in or lemon squeeze a little bit in to give it some flavor and uh, and, and basically that's that's one of the ways of actually taking a non-boring fluid and giving a little bit of, of, of flavor and texture to it. Um, herbal teas are fine, I've got no issues with that. Uh, I know green tea is a slight diuretic but the caffeine content is more natural and this, you still hydrate when you drink green tea. And uh, the reason I try and say limit the coffee intake is because caffeine is very, very acidic. Um, it's highly acidic. And the other thing is that it does play with your, um, it plays with your emotions from the emotional stability point of view and it plays with your energy levels as well. It gives you a good feel, good, bad sort of situation. And one of the things you really want to focus on in leading up to an event is sleep and caffeine can impact that. Although there are some people I know they can drink a cup of coffee and go straight to sleep, but if you're slightly more caffeine intolerant, then it doesn't help. And I'll talk about the caffeine benefits a little bit later. So I'm going to I'm going to open up the the, the the floor now as well to um, to Raymond and uh, also to uh, Sean. Um, I'm just going to bring them on. Uh, Sean, can you hear me there? Hello. Yes, I'm there. Uh, okay, Sean's there, and uh, yeah, I'm here. You got me. Okay, Ray, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Okay, so what, one of the things I want to talk about is is the taper weeks. Let's 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 push this nutrition aside for now, and let's talk about things like uh, volume of training and intensity of training. And um, I'm going to start with you, Raymond. Um, 
you know, you obviously, you're a running coach as well, and you understand the physiological aspects of tapering properly towards a big event like uh, like the Big C, and uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, you've, you've obviously got a very big understanding of that, and, uh, you know, so from your perspective, what should um, the audience be focusing on? Uh, look, I think, um, for me, I, I personally don't like the, the phrase tapering. Um, it kind of has connotations of holiday and sleep, um, etc. So for me, tapering is, is not an ideal term. I prefer the term sharpening. Um, so we certainly, at the moment, in the sharpening phase. Um, the problem with, with tapering is that a lot, of, um, a lot of runners have been doing big mileage since January. You know, they started their first marathon in January, and it's been marathon after marathon after marathon. Um, and so usually with about five to six weeks to go, the runners are feeling pretty exhausted. Uh, they throw in a long run and uh, they begin their taper, which is you know five six weeks out, uh, which is a long way out. And uh, you know tapering in that regard then uh, definitely becomes a um, a holiday. Your body goes into a sleep mode, and to you know to wake it up on race day uh, is um, is not going to happen. Uh, the body's going to be tired. It's going to be sluggish, and um, you know it's you know you're not going to get um, going too quickly. Um, a lot of the the training over the certainly the peak weeks has been a much slower, longer distance type training, uh, which means that the legs are are feeling pretty heavy. Um, the body would have developed some fatigue in that peak in that peak phase. Uh, so as we come off now into the uh, sharpening phase, uh, the sharpening phase is really to get the legs turning over, uh, get a spring back into the legs. Uh, it's reduced volumes uh, or reduced distance. Um, so it would be your quicker, your quicker sessions, things like fart leg sessions. Um, you might put in one or two um, uh, tempo runs or um, uh, time trials, something like that. Um, uh, a couple of um, track sessions uh, where you're doing the shorter repeats, 400 meters, 200 meters, 150 meters, those kind of those kind of sessions, um, and that would certainly get you to to the start of the race feeling fresh and feeling sharp, you know, as opposed to feeling tired and uh, in holiday mode, you know, as I like to call it. Sorry, Ray. Uh I just muted myself there in case there's any back sound. Um, no, I mean that's very interesting, and I mean I, I mean I, I completely agree with, with what you've said. And I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, even when I've tapered for marathons, I've actually, and you, I mean, you know very well that um, I've really taken the time uh, to actually put in a lot of focus when it comes to speed work and that. And on the day, I think that the the actual running pace tends to feel a lot a lot easier on the legs, and the legs feel fresh. In actual fact, I find that. Um, that if you do the sharpening properly, you actually tend to feel like you're holding back in a in a running session. If anything, uh, when it comes to the big day, yeah, yeah. and you've got to you've got to really hold yourself back from actually overpacing yourself. And I, then I think you realise you've actually and I won't use the word taper, but you've sharpened yourself properly for that event. I mean, do you, you would agree with that? Yeah, that's, that's exactly yeah, it, yeah. and that's that's, that's the that's feeling you want, want to arrive at comrades with. with. You know, the last thing you want to do is arrive at the the start line and you're feeling tired and sluggish and heavy. Uh, you know, and then you go go and run 90 kilometers. You know, you really want to get there to the start, feeling, uh, as the commentators, you know, put it full of racing. Um, you know, that's a term that's thrown around often with the commentators, uh, and that's really the feeling that you want to get to when you line up at that start. Um, and so the, it's important over these, like what now, just under two weeks to go. And that's it's important these last two weeks um, to your leaving our sessions as opposed to forcing them in. You know, so if the uh, body's feeling tired and, and drained and, and telling you to rest, then rest. Um, there's there's no point in squeezing in extra sessions and um, you know expecting to gain some benefit from those sessions in the last two weeks. Okay, um, and Sh Sean, how do you how do you sharpen yourself for coverage? I mean, I know that uh, your I think your long last big run was actually uh, I think it was two oceans. You told me. Yeah, uh, two oceans was obviously a 56, and then the week the weekend after that I did a, a 40, and then a 30. Um, and the longest run I've got um, 
and then and the rest of this, this um, taper or sharpening phase would be a 20k. Um, but all I really want to say um, around this topic is the only difference should be and between 10 weeks out and 5 weeks out is, is in the volume of training. Um, so in other words, when sort of uh, you've got 10 weeks to go, you, your, your volume is obviously much higher, but there's got to be intensity in there as well. Um, otherwise, if you're doing what Ray uh, suggested, a lot of people are doing, and you're just doing that heavy plodding stuff, you know, and then you come to the last five weeks, and now you suddenly want to sharpen up. You've had no, no hard training sessions uh, in your comrades' preparation. It's going to be a bit difficult to, to suddenly start introducing to that, uh, that into your training. Um, what you should find though is in the last five weeks as that volume drops off quite radically. So five weeks out then your fourth week and you do 80% of that that high week, let's say in my case it was just over 140 Ks, then three weeks out you do 70% and so you taper it. That's where the word tapering comes in, just on the volume. Um, then you, your intensity sessions, those hard sessions, they, they, you don't immediately feel that benefit. Well, this is what I found. You know, when you start that, that, you know, sharpening phase, you start thinking, when are your legs going to get that bounce back? And it doesn't just happen overnight. I found it takes a week or two of that. Um, so those little sharpening up sessions, your speed work and and, and strides and that you do, well, they should come, um, and you'll start feeling a lot lighter and, and like you you were saying, Ray, ready to race. But that's only the real difference is the volume. I think that intensity needs to be there throughout your combat training. Otherwise, you, you're right, you're just going to plot. Okay, and um, so aside from intensity, I mean, what about um, strength strength uh, and conditioning? So like, um, as a, as a, you know, like hill sessions generally have a longer term effect, but um, like hill repeats and things leading into, into this type of, Area. I mean, would you tend to avoid that and rather focus on speed, or, or do you still throw um, hill sessions into the taper period? Yeah, you see, when you get to my, my sort of comrades' age and, and having run 25 comrades now, I'm a bit more wary of that. You know, when I was younger, um, I would I would still do them, but the, the hill, the strength work is done. I think um, one should rather look at a hill with a with a less um, severe gradient. So it becomes sort of a combination of, of a little bit of hill work and also a bit of speed. So you can run that hill. It can be longer, but not as, as steep. Um, just as part of the sharpening up phase. And Ray, I mean, do you still advocate hill work? I mean, in this, in this period? Uh, no, I, I agree with Sean there. Your strength, you know, your strength work is done. Um, there's, there's, I don't, I don't think there's anything you can really do to, to change where you are at this point, apart from sharpening up. Um, I, I don't advocate um, hill work at this point. In, in my athletes that are slightly stronger at this point, um, uh, with three weeks to go, I put in a last downhill repeat session. Uh, those downhills are done on a very gradual, and I, and I always. Uh, emphasize that very gradual downhill, um, regardless of where you are in the season. Um, I put in a, a last session of downhill repeats, and after that, um, the hill work is done. Um, I don't think it's the time for for hill work this, for hill work this close to uh, to comrades. I simply don't think you're going to benefit. But the speed work will help. Uh, I mean, if you're getting if you're turning the legs over faster and you're going to slow them down on on race day, um, you should feel. A, a lot more comfortable at, at running it at a slower pace. Look, speed, speed work's definitely going to help, and um, I'm glad Sean um, picked that up because, yeah, what I failed to mention is that you obviously can't introduce speed work if you haven't been doing speed work for the last six months. Um, now, certainly your peak week, while you're doing bulk work and you're doing high volumes, um, your, any of my clients would have come off a lot of speed work, and at that point, the speed work will diminish. It won't disappear. Um, as the volume increases, um, just to minimize the, um, the risk of injury. Um, so as you're coming into your peak, as long as you're strong enough and um, your, your legs are well trained enough to handle the speed work, you, you start introducing, and as I said, it doesn't, have to be, it doesn't have to be hard, intense speed work. You could do 
you know, short fart luxation, you know, something a lot more mild and, um, and softer on the body. Uh, and all that's going to do is, is get that springiness back into the legs. And Sean's right, it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, in fact, going into the last week of comrades, in most cases, I feel like the body is never going to come back. Um, and it's really the, that last week, you've had the two weeks of, uh, of taper already. You're into the last week, there's a, lot, a couple more rest days thrown together. And um, by the time you wake up on Saturday morning before race day, you can feel that the legs are back and you, you're feeling ready to race. And so definitely, it doesn't happen overnight. You're coming into the taper period on a, on a bolt phase. And so your legs are tired. They, um, the, the, some of the track sessions are hard work. They feel like hard grind. But you do feel those benefits um, as you get to, to race that. There's no, there's no question. Okay, so I've, I've got an interesting question. And maybe other people out there might be wondering the same thing. So what... Have, so what so you get two types of people that are doing comrades sometimes. One uh, focuses just on mileage, running at a very slow pace and just putting in the distance, distance all the time. And then you get the holistic runner that does uh, the speed work and the distance and that. And I mean, from what kind of an experience can somebody expect to experience on race day if they've only been doing long, slow mileage as opposed to also tossing in now um, a lot of uh, a lot of speed work at the right times, obviously track work, etc. Plus, also putting in the distance. Uh, look, it, it depends um, when your it depends when your mileage build up started. Um, so, as I say, a lot of a lot of runners in South Africa start their they start their comrades training the first of January. You know, they wake up first of January, and uh, they think it's time to start. Um, Comrades training, as in the box. Now, I mean, I think comrades training starts the day after your last comrades. But in terms of the bulk training, they they start in January, where they build up for a marathon at the end of January, and um, two weeks later it's another marathon, or a week later, and so on and so forth. And so they've they've started big mileage six months out. Um, now a lot of those guys will be will be pretty. You know, exhausted, pretty tired. Um, they've um, they've plotted a lot. They've done a lot of long, slow distance. Uh, now, if they if they don't fall into the trap in this last phase of throwing in, you know, one last twenty or one last twenty-five or one last back-to-back -back session, if they don't fall into that trap, then and they listen to their body and recover a little bit more, take a few more rest days, then they can probably still get to comrades feeling fairly, fairly fresh. Um, they will have probably been training most of that bulk anyway at Comrades Race Pace, and so it's just a continuation of that. But the, the key is not to come into that start feeling tired and, and sluggish, because you're in for a long day if that's the case. OK. Um, all right, I'm going to, and Sean, I mean, when do you start your Comrades training? I mean, after Comrades the previous year, when do you actually start your, yeah, your proper no. builder? I think I think the secret to good comrades is, is uninterrupted training, and I I think a common mistake is that yeah people start with, you know focusing on comrades way too soon. Um, I allow myself ten to twelve weeks uh, in the lead up to to comrades for comrades specific training. So I have been running throughout the year. Uh, Mileage and intensity is much less than that of the So, you know, I always made comrades my goal. That's the race that I really want to do well in. Um, and I, if I'm going to run another marathon in the year, I'd like to have it done in February. So that'll be the focus for 10 weeks or 8 weeks in that builder. Um, and then, then 10 to 12 weeks of specific comrades training. And um, like I said, you want uninterrupted training. So if you've been going from January, to May with comrades in mind, and I think a lot of people will do that. They run way too many marathons um, at very close to their planned comrades pace. So the result is I think a lot of people line up in comrades feeling a little bit knackered, um, and it turns out to be a long day. Okay, all right. Um, thanks for that, guys. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to actually start talking about um, the days leading up to the race now, and. Um, I'm just going to uh, switch the slides now and move into 
I just want to see that slide comes up. Okay, so so what I want to talk about is uh, in in basically in in the in the in the days leading up to the race, nutrition plays even more of a critical role now, and this is the the week before the big event. And I think from a, from a nutrition point of view, you need to ensure that you're eating and hydrating consistently and eating and hydrating properly. And I think that's very very critical. Um, as I mentioned here, you should avoid heavy meats unless you're used to it. Um, I mean, I know there are some runners that I've spoken to many times that eat massive steaks the night before a race, and it works for them, but that's what they like to do. Um, the day before the event, you should be extra careful of what you, you're going to eat. Stick to your plan um, and, try, and try not to eat out if you can, because one of the biggest things you can do is eat out in a, in a loaded city or full of restaurants and, in actual fact, land up on race day uh, with, with severe stomach issues and that's the last thing you want and I've seen many many athletes pay a lot of money to get down to a race and uh, they went and ate a pasta uh, the night before and because uh, there's a big race at the town what actually happens is that the pot of boiling water is not changed over so regularly and somebody lands up with digestive issues and or a bit of food poisoning and it's not worth it so try and stick to clean meals that you understand recognize and probably have prepared yourself um, I would say that that's the best thing um, don't overdo it on the carbohydrates. Um, if you're talking about carb loading, I'm not a big fan of it. Remember, when you reduce your volume of training and you're eating naturally, you're going to naturally top up your glycogen stores. So you don't have to eat excessive amounts of carbohydrates. Um, and one of the things that a lot of people do is they actually up their carbohydrate intake significantly the night before a race. And to be quite honest, it's not really going to do much for you. It's just going to disturb your sleep. You're going to feel very full and bloated uh, lying in bed, and it's not really going to make a major benefit on the day. And the sleep uh, the night before is probably the most critical uh, thing to focus on. Try and stick to simple things like um, maybe things like a vegetable omelette on, on toast or, uh, or maybe even scrambled eggs or the side salad or a chicken or a fish dinner or a vegetable salad. Or if you do have a spaghetti bolognese or whatever, just make sure that it's, it's clean and that you've prepared it properly and, don't overeat. There's no need to overeat. The, the most critical meal is actually probably um, uh, the morning of the race. And I think that that's, uh, that's far, far more critical is the race day meal. Um, I'm going to, I just want to bring uh, Raymond and Sean back in. Um, uh, can you guys, I mean, from a from an eating perspective and from a training preparation perspective, where where's your focus in that week leading up to, to the marathon? Ray, you want to maybe start with you? <laughs> Hello? Raymond? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can hear you. Yes, yeah. I think the, um, I think the important thing is that um, guys don't attempt to change their diet um, at this point. Um, so in other words, you know, don't um, if you're keen on a high carb diet, don't try and change it to a low carb, high fat diet at this point. Um, you know, rather take, um, you know, as you've been saying, take stuff out of the diet. Don't add stuff into the diet. So eat, eat what you're used to eating. You know what you've been eating. Um, your body is adapted for that. Um, you know, now is not the time to be to be fiddling with your with your diet. Um, I agree with you. Keep it, um, you know, keep it natural. Keep it, um, um, keep it healthy, and um, you know, try and cook your your own meals. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything on on my diet at this point. Uh, Sean, I mean, you. Uh, what about your your focus when it comes to nutrition that week before? You know, I think you guys are both you know, hit the nail on the head there. You know, at this point in time, one shouldn't be experimenting with with uh, your diet. Um, obviously, I was a slow learner in those early years, and I was uh, only discovered much later that in, in my running career that wheat and dairy uh, didn't agree with me. And in the last four years, I've known I must avoid that those those food, food types. So yeah, I sort of know what I've got to do, and I don't introduce anything fancy or exotic. Um, you you also right. If you home cook food, stuff that you're used to having that you you 
you know, been brought up over the last few years and that is the stuff you've got to stick to. So I don't quite follow the, the high fat thing, but I definitely do try and cut back on the carbs a bit. Um, and yeah, um, the tendency is to want to, because you've got a little bit of time on your hands, is to, to snack a little bit more. Um, but I think you covered that quite well earlier on about filling your day with, with eating and gaining a bit of weight. You want to try and avoid that. I think the um, hydration is also very important. You know, you want to line up on the day um, knowing that you're properly hydrated and yeah, ready to go. Okay, that's great. Um, just something I want to mention, and I've been at two expos recently where I was approached by people who were uh, eating low carb, high fat, only for a, a period of maybe uh, eight weeks, and um, and uh, they were planning on racing on peanuts and biltong, and um, they had never done it before. But uh, but basically, I actually requested uh, before before you go and do your race on peanuts and biltong, can I at least do a blood test on you just to see that you are like in a fat burning state? Because if you're not, you could land yourself up in trouble. And both of them were not in a fat burning state, so. I think it's very important to understand if you if you are on the low carb high fat diet and you're planning on going that route on race day. I'm not saying that you won't be fat efficient, but um, you need to actually be very selective of your of your fueling strategy on the day and make sure make sure that you've tested it in in a training session. Don't arrive on race day and suddenly say, "Well, I'm going to try something because this is the way I've been eating." You might not necessarily be in the right zone uh, to take advantage of that. So we'll talk about race day now. Um, so, so I think one of the things to focus on the night before a race is sleep, and, and definitely, like Sean mentioned, hydration is very, very critical. If you don't arrive at race day 100% hydrated, and, and by that I don't mean that you've got just drunk water, I mean that the water that you've actually consumed has been absorbed into the muscles because you need that fluid sitting inside of the, the, the muscles in order to be able to be properly hydrated. Uh, there's no point in arriving 70 or 80 percent hydrated. This is a very long day for a lot of people. It's a very long day, um, and uh, and it's something that you really, really need to focus on. Um, I'm going to switch to the next slide, which is um, which is actually race day. Um, before I actually discuss it properly, I just want to ask, like in that week from a training perspective, um, obviously there's there's a lot more, there's a lot less training, and there's more keeping your legs up and, and trying to keep your legs as fresh as possible, yet there is still a bit of sharpening in that week. Am I correct in saying that, Raymond, I mean, as, uh, I mean in, that, in, that, in those few days before the race? 100%. Um, I think um, the amount of rest you need in a last week, you know, depends, you know, is a variable on each person. Um, so I would normally, you know, put in uh, two or three rest days in that last week. Um, so a typical example might be a rest day on Monday, um, 10 to 50s on a Tuesday, a rest on Wednesday, um, 15 150s on Thursday, rest Friday, a 25-minute run, very easy run on Saturday with four pickups, uh, and you're done. Um, now that, that might be for your slightly stronger runner. Um, for a, um, a slower, perhaps less um, strong runner, you might have a you know 45 minute run on Monday, um, 10 150s on Tuesday, uh, rest Wednesday, rest Thursday, rest Friday, 25 minutes on Saturday, a uh, couple of light pickups, and then race day um, comrades on, on Sunday. Okay. All right. That's awesome. And uh, and Sean, I mean, how do you? What do you do in those days leading up to the actual race day? Yeah, I, I think um, I run Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Definitely, um, probably seventy minutes, uh, fifty minutes, and then half an hour. And then Thursday, Friday, I won't run at all. Um, Saturday morning, I'll go for a 25-minute jog around the block. Um, we've got a couple of strides in between, and that's just to uh, wake the muscles up that they've gone totally to sleep and uh, prepared for something that's going to happen the next day. Okay. All right. So you guys are both on the same page there. All right. So let's get to the to the actual race day. So I think the the first daunting thing about about a down run is if you're staying in Durban, you've got to get still to Peter Maritzburg. <laughs> So, which is quite a distance. So I think the time that you wake up uh, is very critical because the time 
that you eat before that race plays a very critical goal. You can't eat uh, an hour or, or two hours before the race. The best time to eat is probably a, a good three hours before. Um, and uh, you, you need to get that food into your system. And um, eating too close to the race obviously just makes it uh, a lot more stressful and less comfortable, but there are ways of still topping up uh, along the way. Um, another, another thing that I, I just want to mention is that, and I see and I hear this a lot, and even in ultras, even in things like Ironman, I, I hear people saying, I can't eat a pre-race meal. Well, that is absolutely crazy. You cannot go and do an event like this without eating a proper pre-race meal. It really plays such a critical role uh, on race day. Um, I usually say that your, your meal shouldn't spike your blood sugar levels. Uh, it should be, you should be aiming for something around 300 calories, um, not really less than that. And uh, generally, depending on the kind of diet that you're on, I mean, I generally advocate a, a, a blend of carbohydrates, protein, and fats. Uh, one of the things I actually do in the week leading up to a big ultra event is I focus on medium chain triglycerides. So uh, when I say that, I'm talking about your MCTs. They're fats that cannot really be stored but can be utilized for energy. <clears throat> and in a long, long endurance event, things like coconut oil are very quickly accessible and they can play a very, very crucial role. So I tend to up those MCTs in a couple of days leading up to an event. Um, things like a low GI bread or 100% rye or oats or seed loaf with peanut butter or banana or whatever, something, something that, that, is, that is fairly decent but it's not going to spike your blood sugar. Um, generally, I actually I was quite a big fan of, of rolled oats um, um, simmered in coconut uh, milk or co and coconut oil and, and, and lay, laden with almond butter and a couple of berries. And that was generally always my, look, that's my pre-marathon meal. But um, recently I found a, a very big love for eggs eggs on, on toast. So <laughs> I think it's just, uh, it just depends on what the body requires at that particular point in time. I know some people that eat sweet potatoes or brown rice uh, before or quinoa or peanut butter and soya milk as well. So I think it varies from person to person. And, I, I see there are some questions around pre-training meals or pre-race meals, so I will get to those questions. I will answer them. Um, uh, Raymond and Sean, I mean, what, what do you guys actually advocate as a as, – what do you guys do personally for a pre-race pre, pre uh, race meal? Uh, I, um, yeah, I, I like the uh, Papa's five start. Um, probably be up at 3 o'clock at least. Um, I just feel I've got to have something in my stomach at least two hours before I start running. Um, and yeah, a typical snack or, or breakfast for me on race day would be a slice of rye, rye bread toasted, some peanut butter on it, um, maybe a small banana, um, and that's, that's sufficient for me. Um, and an hour before uh, the gun goes, I will have probably have five, six hundred moles of your um, Endure um, drink, nice cold drink, and then sip on water until uh, start time. Well, how much fluid would you say you take in, Sean, before before the event? I mean, I find that if it's I'll cold, have, uh, sorry, carry on. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have at least, you know, between five and six hundred moles um, of of 32 GI um, endure. Okay, I actually can't. I can't handle amounts of 500 mils because I've got a weak bladder. And the, and it, and I think from the Peter Maritzburg, the down run, it's going to be so cold. I think that <laughs> I'd have to like tone down my fluid intake. But I think that's quite important. Everybody's different, um, and everybody has different fluid intake requirements. So just uh, just something to take notice of. Ray, what about you? Yeah, I agree with Sean. I. I think um, two hours before before start is um, ideal to eat. I think um, I don't think you need to go further back than that. Um, so normally two hours before I'll have um, uh, depending on um, you know how hungry I'm feeling I'll have um, uh, low GI toast with butter and two eggs, um, and then I'll sit on a protein shake. Uh, I try and limit my carbs before the start of, a, of the race. I don't want my, um, I, I don't want to spike my insulin levels. Um, you know, insulin levels uh, or your spiked insulin uh, prevents your body from from burning fat. And so, too much carb before the start puts you into um, 
you know, to carbohydrate burning mode as opposed to fat burning mode, which which is what we want. Um, so I have my two eggs, butter and toast, and uh, a protein shake that I, which I sift, so it's about 500 mils of liquid as well. Uh, once I get down to the start, though, I don't have anything to drink. I do my warm-up run, I get into the start batch, and um, the first bit of liquid I have is probably at the, the first or second table. Um, and then about um, 35, 45 minutes in, I'll have my first, um, my first portion of 32 GI endurance. Um, just as a matter of interest, uh, how, I mean, both of you are, are quite good runners. I mean, Ray, you're also a consistent silver medalist. So, so the thing is, um, so when it comes to, uh, to, um, to the frequency of feeding yourself during the event, do you tend to stick to more liquid feeding or do you sometimes actually um, uh, take in actual food solids while you're actually running? I get hungry and I, um, I find that after that breakfast, um, and normally for me it's consistently around 18-23 Ks, um, somewhere in that, in that um, uh, between those two boards, I, I start to get hungry and uh, at that point I must get something solid into my stomach. Um, if I don't, then I find that later on I actually can't eat uh, despite being hungry and then I start to suffer. So, so that, that early on in that race, first 18 to 20 k's, um, I um, I like to get something in, and that would be you know a quarter uh, sandwich with um, chicken mayo and butter on it, or it might just be chicken mayo or peanuts, or in fact I don't eat peanuts anymore, but it might be um, some nuts, bolt-on, but anything. I've got to get something solid in at that point. And I think for you know if we're talking to 20% of the listeners here who are um, well, first-time comrades, runners, and uh, I'm not sure how many of them will be out there all day, but let's assume you know, 20% of our listeners are going to be out there for 11, 12 hours. Then you're going to need solids um, through the day. Um, you know, you, you try and sit at work and just go on, on liquids for the, the day. You'll, you feel pretty tired by the end of the day, so, and that's without running. Uh, so I believe you've got to have a mix of liquids and, and solids through the day. The faster guys, like um, Sean, you know, they need, need less of a solid. <laughs> Sean, no, no, I, I know what you do, but you, you can explain to everybody else how you feel yourself uh, during the run and if you do take in any solids, etc. Yeah, um, the first uh, probably uh, well, I'm trying to think now, probably about 12 k's into the race, I'll, I'll, I'll just have a sip of water along the way. My first. Um, Accelerate drink, I'll, I'll take, take and just as you crest and, and go over the little, little hill at the top of uh, Ashburton Ash store. And then uh, I, I, have, I normally have about 400 mils on standby at every six kilometer intervals roughly. Um, I drink as much of that 400 as I feel comfortable with. So mostly I don't finish the whole 400. So roughly every, every hour I'm probably getting between six, six and seven and nine miles uh, on the accelerator and, and then I'll take a little bit of water, water and, and when I feel like I need it, it uh, in addition to that, 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 that water, water normally, normally comes, comes in the last 20-30 days and it's not getting even hotter and, and, and a lot of it goes over the top of my head as it flows in my mouth. But yeah, I don't take any solids, I've never tried it in my training, I've never felt the need to introduce it in a race situation either. Okay, I think your pace is higher though as well, so I think it's quite difficult to consume and, and eat while you're racing. I just wanted to uh, ask you something. How many scoops of uh, Accelerate do you put into the bottle? Um, it, you said into a 400 ml, just to get an idea of how many grams of carbohydrates you're taking in per an hour. Yeah, it's, it's, it's generally measured on, the, on two scoops for, uh, per 500 ml. Okay, so you, so you, and you say you consume about 400 of it. Okay. All right. So that's uh, so if you're finishing uh, if you're finishing uh, so if you if you're doing two scoops per five hundred, uh, you're looking at about uh, yeah, it's about forty seven grams of carbohydrates. So you're taking about between around fifty five grams of carbs per an hour. Um, but I just need to mention to the audience that the pace that you're running at is quite a higher pace, 
and the amount of carbohydrate intake you need to support that, that, that running effort would probably be around that region. Um, I know that there are some people that try and go with this uh, with the with the 60 to 90 gram and I actually I'll put a slide up now um, because it's, it's one of the things that uh, people do make mistakes of on, on race days that um, uh, many athletes get get things wrong where they're not consuming frequently through an event and I think that that's something that's quite important don't leave your body for two to three hours and then suddenly try and consume some food because your, your digestive system is not going to take too kindly to it you rather want to be small and consistent uh, feeding through the event we call it drip feeding but it definitely will keep your blood sugar levels a lot more stable and it also keep your digestive system a lot more uh, 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 sort of uh, comfortable um, so, so those are two base rules, eat small and frequently, only drink to thirst. Um, when I talk about the big mystery to 60 to 90 grams of carbs per hour, it's an extremely difficult thing to do. And most people, especially runners, they try and reach this volume, they end up with uh, GI or gastro gastrointestinal distress. Um, the reason being is that the body just cannot absorb that amount. For a cyclist, it might be slightly easier because your body is not moving and bouncing from side to side. But when you're running, your organs are bouncing from side to side. There's a lot more sensitivity. And uh, the other thing is that uh, in an event of this nature, it becomes a very difficult uh, task to do. I don't know, Ray, Ray, I mean, what's your take on that? Um, my take on um, I'm trying consuming. to shove, yeah, excessive consuming. We're trying to get in like up to 90 grams of carbs per an hour. Yeah, I yeah, think you've, you've got to be careful, careful because, because uh, you know, a lot of guys will see them throwing up around a 60K mark. Um, you know, and everyone sort of puts it down to dehydration, but in a lot of cases, it's um, it's simply a, ca a case of too much carbohydrate. Um, you know, your body can't deal with it, so that's only going to come out one way. way. So I think you've got to be careful. I would, you know, if you're feeling sorry, you feel nauseous, um, you know, along, and it's only going to come up a late on, the you know, continuously consuming. If you're starting to feel nauseous, then I would say, you know, cut back, you know, stop the carbohydrate intake altogether. Uh, give it a, a, a little bit and um, I'm pretty sure we start to feel better and then you can start gradually reintroducing it. Um, but yeah, I'm always, uh, I'm always cautious on too much carbohydrate um, consumption. Another important thing I want to mention, and Sean just brought it up, uh, Sean mentioned when he was speaking is that uh, he, he tends to consume more water as the day goes on. Remember when it's f first thing in the morning it's extremely cold and the body doesn't need it's not losing as much fluid as it will lose later on when it heats up quite significantly. Um, so you'll lose less fluid earlier on in the day and you'll, you'll probably lose a little bit more fluid later on in the day. But one of the things that Sean mentioned was that he doesn't always get the water in his mouth. He generally ends up throwing it over his head. And I think that is such a very important statement. And the reason I say that is because uh, nausea doesn't just come from food. Nausea comes from also excessive fluid intake. Because what actually happens is if you do take in too much water on race day, um, and I've got no problem saying this because dehydration to me is not really a major issue. Most athletes finish an event slightly dehydrated. But if you take in too much fluid, um, especially in the form of water, remember the osmolality of water is a lot lower than adding a, a carbohydrate to it where the absorption rate is, is a lot higher. Um, and you do not take up that fluid. Eventually it starts to slosh around in your stomach. And eventually you are going to get to a stage where you might be slightly hypnotremic or you know, you've overhydrated uh, to a certain extent. You will feel those symptoms of dizziness, nausea, fatigue, uh, creeping in, even cramping. It can lead to cramping because it might dilute your 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 sodium levels significantly. And 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 that's what I tell people. You need to separate your energy and your hydration requirements. Um, if you rely on a bottle for energy and it's cold, good luck because uh, you're not going to consume and get the amount of calories in that you want because you'll sip less. Um, if it's a lot hotter and you're relying on the bottle, well, that's great because then you can get it, but Remember, um, work, work your intake on the least amount of liquid that you would require to consume in the day. If you, if you just drink to thirst, I think that you'll be good, it'll be good enough. If you consume something uh, which has got flavor to it or color to it, sometimes that tricks your thirst mechanism because it leaves a dryness in your mouth. The best thing to do is to rinse your mouth out with water or have a little bit of water but rinse your mouth out, then carry on running and then see how you feel at a later stage. But the body will message you and tell you when you're thirsty. And the thing is that you shouldn't overdo it with, with, uh, with fluid. I've landed up in a situation where I've taken in too much fluid, and eventually you will start to slow down, you might start to walk, and you might start to feel fatigued and dizzy and nauseous. And the worst thing is, is that once you're in that state, 
you, your body tricks you into keep cons you keep consuming fluid unnecessarily. And um, so if you get to a state where you feel that there is a sloshing in your stomach, stop the drinking. You won't dehydrate. If you have to pour the water over your head, like Sean mentioned, and maybe try and consume something in the form of salt um, or sodium to try and absorb or help that fluid uptake uh, for a while and then only uh, go back to fluid consumption. Uh, Ray, I mean, what, you, you know, you, you, you understand this topic quite intimately as well. I mean, have you got anything to, to talk about on that? Yeah, I think, I think what, what's uh, something, something very important, important for guys to remember is that, that um, um, on no, no other, other race, race that, that you've, you've done, done throughout the year are there tables every one, one and a half to two k's. You know, all the other races, the table, watering tables are every three k's. Uh, now you get now to you comrades, get to and uh, in the first half, I think they're every 2K, they're about one or two at a speed, and in the second half, they're every one and a half to one kilometer. So if you're taking a water at every water table, uh, you know, that's a hell of a lot of water. So if you're going to take water at every table, then take a few sips, you know, don't finish the whole, um, the whole session. Um, you know, use it to, to cool yourself, to spray over yourself, etc. But you need to be very aware of the number of water tables on the Comrades route versus any other marathon or race that we do in this country. Okay, and uh, I mean, Sean, you've you've got your set amount. I mean, you obviously drink to thirst, and and that's it. Yeah, I I've, I've, I've put about fourteen or fifteen guys out on the route, so. That's where I get my accelerate from, and then the tables, obviously, the water comes from there. I think the rays are so correct in the amount of tables, and also the size of the tables. Um, the, 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 the bulk of the field, when they get to the tables, they, they're quite congested, so you end up spending a little bit more time, I guess, at the table. So you think, well, because I'm here, I might as well have something more to drink. Um, I think because of that fear of dehydration, so, I think the risk is, like you mentioned, the tendency might be just to overhydrate. I think uh, one of the big mistakes that athletes make is when they're feeling very hot, they think that drinking will actually help cool the body down, but it's not, it's not, the, it's not the case. If you really want to cool yourself down, rather pull water over your head or even throw water into, the, into your core area and your groin area, um, that actually is where your body temperature is actually maintained, and that's the best way to actually cool your system down. Um, I just want to uh, mention a few things. I mean, I'm actually running comrades this year as well. <laughs> and one of the things I've always advocated is that um, it's, it's like for me, I'm going to actually leave a bottle of protein or maybe two bottles around the 40 to 60 kilometer mark. And it's a protein carbohydrate drink. But I, I know that with me, when I've done my long runs, uh, for example, I find that taking in a little bit of protein during the event actually helps um, stabilize me a little bit. It takes the hunger away. And it, it, it's, it's, it, just, it just makes me feel a little bit stable. So that's something that, I, that, I, that I, I would like to do. And I do advocate it to other people as well. I've done it in, in other ultra-distance events, and uh, it works quite well. Uh, Ray, I mean, do you advocate any protein consumption uh, like Midway? Look, I think um, you've got to be careful of not trying anything new on race day. You know, so if you haven't used protein in um, training runs or in in other races, you know, comrades dress rehearsal races, then you know, you, I wouldn't recommend that you throw that into the mix now. Uh, personally, I um, I do like to take on a protein shake on the run. I normally do it around the halfway mark thereabouts. Um, uh, we I normally take in a, a protein shake, and I'm getting um, you know the protein and a bit of fat, etc. But um, so I, I find it, um, you know, it's, it's hard to say whether it works, whether it, it does anything or not. But I mean, for me, if anything else, it changes the taste of stuff and gives you, you know, something completely different to taste and to to have in your system. Um, and I certainly think that the protein is, um, you know, beneficial. But I wouldn't throw in anything new in the mix if you know if that hasn't been tried uh, pre comrade. Okay, I think uh, I'm just going to run through some of the questions here related to uh, race day nutrition. Um, somebody said which products are recommended at, on Comrades Race Day and at which intervals. Um, uh, they've written here yeah, between the two tablets powder and dew accelerate. And I think what you stress is that it needs to be a tr tried in training first of all. I think that's quite key. And uh, and second of all is to, you know, like everybody is different. I mean, if you you, you need to take the, the food that's palatable to you 
um, look at the amount of carbohydrates or protein or fat that's in that product and calculate per an hour how much you feel that you would need to take in um, and and work out those kind of intervals. I generally like to, to feed at least every 30 to maximum 45 minutes. Um, uh, I don't like to feed much longer than that. To feed once an hour is just it's just too long. My, my digestive system doesn't handle it very well. Um, but but again, I, I you know, with me, I'm 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 a bit more of a fat efficient athlete, and I like to run I like to run quite a bit on on sort of minimalistic fueling, and, and that's just what I feel very comfortable with. Um, uh, uh, Matt asked here um, about future life. Does it make a good pre race meal? Um, I think my answer to you there, Matt, is that if you if you if you're already using it as a pre-race meal and you're used to it and you enjoy it and you're happy with it, I think that's great. I, I like to beef it up a little bit, but like uh, when I say, I will, not me personally, but uh, I like to recommend to people to, to, to if, they, if they have some servings of that, um, to try and add a little bit more fat and, and, and protein to it in order to try and uh, make sure that it's a bit more substantial. And that Also remember, um, anything over 50 grams of carbohydrate um, you remember, if you're looking at uh, low GI or the GI index, that the measurement is actually up to 50 grams. That's what they've decided. So, uh, in some countries, in actual fact, you're not allowed to say low GI or medium GI. In Europe, it's banned. And the reason being is that um, in, in, large, in countries where people might be a little bit larger, they actually tend to, to eat more than 50 grams of carbs. And then you're looking at glycemic loading as opposed to the glycemic index. And generally, what actually happens is that the blood sugar levels actually rise quite significantly. Um, so you can eat uh, one banana and you can be pretty comfortable, but eat five bananas or four bananas and, and your blood sugar levels rise. So by adding some fat and protein to that, I think you minimize the risk and you actually bring down uh, the risk of actually spiking your blood sugar levels. But otherwise, if you're used to it, I think that's, that's fine. Um, uh, I, I don't see an issue um, with that at all. Um, uh, I mean, as far as... as uh, as, uh, as fat fueling, I think that uh, Raymond quite mentioned this quite early on. There's a lot of companies that advocate consuming a gel <coughs> at the start of Comrades or at the start of an Ironman or at the start of whatever race. And I'm so against that because the minute you spike your, your blood sugar levels, as Raymond mentioned earlier, you mitigate the ability to utilize your fat stores. And if you're running uh, an event uh, such as this, you are running in what I'd in, in a pace which I determine to be a fat burning pace. Uh, you're not running at a pace which is at a glycogen burning pace because if you're running at a much higher intensity, obviously you, you're obviously going to deplete your glycogen stores a lot quicker and you're using more glycogen. But in a race like this, you actually are utilizing uh, fat as a predominant source of fuel. And, and, and that's a fact. Unless you haven't trained for it at all, and you're a little bit overweight, and you're really pushing your body to the limit um, the whole way. But in that case, I don't see you actually getting to the finish line. So, so I think that that's one of the most important things. I mean, your glycogen stores are there, but you want to try and spare them and save them as much as possible. And I think that if you can, uh, you know, this is a very pace-controlled race. If you can take advantage of your fat stores, I think you'll feel a lot better for that. Um, and the way to take advantage of it is to minimize the volume of the... Uh, of blood glucose spiking products that you take in on route because the minute you actually start to take them in, you are going to land up uh, in a little bit of trouble. And, and, and fat is a very powerful form of fuel. I mean, you know that it's nine calories per gram, so uh, whereas a carbohydrate and a protein are only one, well, the protein is not really a fuel, but they're only one gram um, will give you about four calories. So it, it, it's, you're looking at, at two times more powerful than a gram of carbs, and I think that that's quite, uh, it's quite important to note. Um, so... But taking in little amounts of, of, of carbohydrates through the race is not going to really spike your blood sugar levels. But if you take an excessive amount and load, especially before the start of the race, I think that you're putting yourself at a at a severe disadvantage. Uh, Ray, I mean, would you would you agree with that? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And I think um, you know, there's um, so if you, if you mix it up, you know, and you have um, thirty-two GI at um, whatever it is, 15 k's, um, and you have a sandwich at 20 k's, um, and another 32 GI portion um, at 30 k's. You know, the, the sandwich is still giving you the, the carbs, so you don't, you don't necessarily have to stick to a liquid carb intake, um, especially if you're out there for a long time, and you're going you're gonna to need some 
you have some food in your in your stomach. Um, your obviously your your stomach slows down, um, and you, it doesn't uh, digest it as quickly. But you still need some you know something substantial in your in your stomach. And so, and so there's a lot of ways to substitute your um, you know your carb uh, your carb intake. One of the things that I I use, which is a, it's got a carb drink, but I use um, hydrosis. Um, you could probably use um, sports rehydrate. I haven't tried that product, but um, hydrosis works for me. And what I find, especially in the second half, you start to get that. You, you know, you, it's getting warmer. You're thirsty. You take more liquid, and you get this slushy liquid feeling in your stomach. Um, and I just find a hydrosis helps um, take that, absorb that out of your stomach. And uh, it actually leaves me feeling quite angry. So in the past, where I would have something to eat solid at 20 k's and then nothing for the rest of the race, I now find with hydrosis that I'll have my, uh, something to eat at 20 k's and then at 60 k's I'm looking around for something to eat. Um, so that definitely clears the, the liquid out of your stomach and takes away that squashy, that squashy feeling and, and helps you uh, hydrate. Yeah, that's what I mentioned earlier on. If you if you overhydrate by taking in some salt or some sodium, it, will, it should help with the absorption and get, get that fluid uh, absorbed, um, which yeah, is quite correct. important. Uh, I, that's why I don't advocate drinking water on its own, too much water on its own, because remember the absorption rate, or the fluid absorption rate is so many mils per 20 minutes, and there's no way you can take in six, 700 mils of, water, of plain water on its own without any other substance to help with the fluid intake and, ex and expect to empty uh, the, the, the gastric system. It's just not going to empty, and it is going to build up over time. And like uh, Raymond and Sean said, most people are going to be out there for many, many hours through that. And even if, you, even if you're only there for seven or seven and a half hours, it's still a long time to be out, even for a fast runner. So I think that's quite important. Um, I don't know if there's any more questions, uh, um, but if you have got any questions, just feel free to ask. You can use the question box. I'm going to just bring up a, a, another poll, um, and I just want to um, I want you guys to answer because uh, one of the things that I like to do is, uh, is, is actually ask people how important